Amen. Well, I want to pray. That was a great introduction. Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus. We do trust completely in you, Lord, and not ourselves, Lord. By ourselves, we can do nothing, Lord. So we remain in you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, Lord. Have your full way so these people can have a touch from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time I was talking, I think it was two weeks ago, and I had a nice teaching lesson for my son, and uh, he's a wrestler, and he went and he lost uh, a couple close matches and lost one he wasn't supposed to lose in a tournament. And uh, he was literally crying and yelling in defeat. Take, come get me. I quit. I'm done with this. And there were some words he shouldn't be saying as a Christian young man. And I had to encourage him. I said, hey, we don't quit. We got to keep on keeping on. And I said, God will teach you something. Whatever we do, we don't quit. You don't want to do it next year. That's, that's good and fine, but we don't quit. And he goes, and by the time I was preaching on that Friday, he had already won two more matches. Well, the next day he goes and wins three, gets into the finals, and beat a kid who's beat him three times in his career and wins the whole tournament. <laughs> so amen. Amen. So God is in the turnaround business. But he'll have to humble you sometimes. He's got to humble you. If we don't stay humble, I don't care who you are, what kind of mega anointing you have, what kind of off-the-hook preacher you are, what kind of gift you have, what level talent you have. If you get out on your own and you lose that humility, you're going to be in trouble. And uh, that applies to all of us. And uh, this, this world is tough. There's highs and lows. Uh, last time, two weeks ago, I was talking about this supernatural event where God just sent me three people I didn't call out of a jail cell to get a touch from the Holy Ghost. That's only to get followed by the next two services I did on Monday were shut down abruptly by the security guards, so there was no altar call. The next Thursday I come in, I, I peeked in the chaplain's office, and she wasn't there, so I thought, ooh, I can push a little bit longer. There's no one behind me for two hours. I go 29 minutes past my time, they're not supposed to stand. They're standing. I'm not supposed to cast out demons. And I'm casting out a demon out of some guy who's majorly infected. He's against the wall gyrating. And the phone rings and it's got caller ID and it says chaplain's office. <laughs> I left with fear like, oh no, this is it. I mean, one or two things you might get away with, but three things, three rules you break. Then I come over to the halfway house. We got across the street. They're none of the guys that you'll see that are there now, so it was guys that were there. Don't, 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 don't try to find these guys. But I go over there, and one's, oh, he's detoxing, and he's letting these moans out. My wife has given birth to all, I was there when she gave birth to all three of my kids. This thing he's groaning with looks like he's trying to deliver a hippopotamus. It was God-awful moaning, and the guys that are in the halfway house, they can't stand it. And there's some kind of demon in there. It's, it's not even opioid withdrawal. And it's some, he's going, you know, it's so terrible. we got to move him across the street to this other building. He's coming around like a hospital victim. He's in his underwear. we got another guy there, and I'm just kind of dumbfounded. I'm thinking, oh, man, this thing is tough. And another guy is there, and he just got out of jail, and he's all on fire again. He got a miracle in his court case. And a new guy comes along that I hadn't seen. Some of these guys had known him from the inside. And uh, I'm just sitting there saying nothing. I'm kind of thinking about, am I getting kicked out of the jails? I'm dealing with this guy that's moaning. And we're talking about now these guys want to run some evangelistic outreach. And I'm thinking, you want to run an evangelistic outreach? And I'm, he's moaning. You got out of jail. I mean, this place looks like a tornado whipped through it. We, we, we got it slapped together with used, you know, used drywall, you name it, a shower out of something we'd stuffed in there. And the, and, and the guy's kind of jumping on board, the new guy, and he starts, he goes, man, I'm blessed. I got a job. I've been in prison a couple years. My testimony, he shares it. And I'm not trying to disrespect his testimony, but I'm just kind of in my own world. And uh, he says, look, if you need help, if you need, I got some powerful brothers. You need someone to run this, you know, essentially run this ministry for you? Need someone to be a preacher? I got some guys for you. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. Okay, I got to let the preach go now because this guy's got me confused. And I begin to let this Holy Ghost preach 
go and I said, hey, things are going good for you now, but here's how the devil works. Whenever something gets going, he's going to make a counterattack. Best believe, if you don't see the devil move, you're not doing much. The minute you start moving and advancing the kingdom of God, I'm talking about casting out demons, healing the sick, making a real disciple. You know, he sucks Jesus out of people all day long. I've never met a guy in, in jail that can't tell you about Jesus from the virgin birth to the resurrection of the dead. Everybody in America knows about Jesus, but knowing Jesus is a little bit different. Loving Jesus and obeying Jesus is completely different. And I began to tell him, I said, hey, nothing new's coming your way, but your old problems is what he does. You've got a nice little hedge of protection around you. You've been praying. You've been fasting. You get a nice little group of guys in jail. You got nothing to do. There's no cable in there. There's, there's no free will to who's changing that channel. And you've got to stand up and watch it. It's got a terrible reception. So you're tuning into the word of God. You, you've got a little desperation. You've got a court case. You, you've got a bad lawyer. It's a crooked system. And you need help. And so God's moving, and he puts you under this hedge of protection when you're obedient. Then I said, the devil's going to try to move you out of there so he can get you. The next day, this guy, after three years of being in jail, whatever, is relapsing on meth. The next day, you think, I know you've been to a church, and they sing some songs to you. You've been real happy at church. I, I, I know your pastor, he, he fronts a good game. It's a good front out there. I've been to 50 churches in Maricopa County. It looks good. I mean, if I was making 100 grand a year, I, I 50 at least, I'd have to put on a smile and a good game. Since I'm not getting any money, I can just come here and be real with you. Right. I can just tell you how it really works. Right. And the reality is we got to be intentional and in staying close to God. And the devil's smart. You want to go through deliverance? Well, deliverance is a process. There's nothing God won't deliver you from. He's going to deliver you. But you got to keep working on your deliverance. I mean, you got to edify yourself. Yeah, we got to praise God. We got to worship. We got to fellowship. We got to surround ourselves with a cloud of great witness. We can't neglect the gathering of the saints as many get in the habit of doing so. There's things we have to do, but there has to be a part of your life where you're going through deliverance. You will pick up spirits. I pick up spirits. I've been in this for seven years. I was up in... Uh, pacing, and I was up there with my wife. It's my birthday. I'm feeling good, and and no kids, and that's even better. And all of a sudden, we got cable. I got no cable at my house. I cut that garbage long ago. But she's got cable, so I'm taking advantage of cable. And uh, mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle comes on. Well, he used to have this thing called Chappelle Show, and I thought, oh, he's kind of funny. Yeah, he's a little iffy on his, you know, morality. But if it gets too bad, I'll cut it off. Well. He jumps in, he starts blaspheming God's name within five minutes. And I, oh, it hit me right here. The second time my wife looks at me like, hey, you're in charge here. Are you going to put up with this? <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, man, I'm already laughing. This is already funny. This, this guy's, you know, he's, he's funny as you can be. By the fourth time I cut it out, I'm going to bed. The next morning I'm praying and I'm repenting. I'm repenting. I say, hey, Lord, I'm supposed to honor your name. It says anybody that misuses your name, by no means will he go unpunished. That man is waiting the wrath of God. He is operating in disobedience. I don't care what kind of money you got. You're in trouble using his name in vain. And I begin to repent, and literally something ah, comes out of my mouth. I don't want my wife to think I'm crazy, so I go, hey, I got to tell you what that was. <laughs> I have not. She gets worried sometimes. She looks at me. I minister with sex offender, rapists, murderers. And how was today? I, I, I'm to the point, I don't think she cares how the day was. She wants to know if I brought anything home. That's crazy. And I said, hey, I, that spirit came out from listening to that blasphemy. I picked up a lust demon from that 70s show one time. I said I didn't have cable, but I got free TV. <laughs> And it's just some show where a bunch of kids are living sinful, disrespecting doofus adults, and they're down there, and one of the girls decides she wants to send nude pictures to her boyfriend. It doesn't even show any cleavage, nothing. And then these guys get a hold of the photos, and I didn't scan her whole body, wonder what the whole thing looked like naked. That night, I had a dream, and I knew it was right from the pit of hell. It wasn't something coming up from my soul. It was put there because a woman who caused me great pain and suffering Back in the day, it was her nude, and the body was perfect, but that face. I said, oh, I knew that was the devil. It was in my dream. It was able to come into my subconscious 
from just a power of suggestion, thinking about nakedness, just looking at sexual immorality, the fact that an unmarried woman would, would take some pictures of herself and se send it to some guy she's not married to, just, just putting up with this kind of thing. See, God's ways are far above our ways. And his thoughts are far higher than our thoughts. And when you come down to the world's level, hey, that doesn't seem too bad. That doesn't seem like too much, but we're accountable for much. We're to, we're to be used as a vessel for God, a weapon in God's hands. Well, he can't use you when you're loaded with sins. You're loaded with drugs and porn and unforgiveness, guilt and shame, poor self-worth. You'll never even get to the root problems you have. Those are just surface things he just threw in your head. But if you're going to really walk through this deliverance, you've got to have a mindset for God to be searching your heart and to show you and expose to you the things that are offensive to him. Not to you, because they're not offensive to us. Our, this flesh is deceitfully wicked. That didn't seem that, that offensive. I, wasn't, I watched TV for 40 minutes and for the whole week. It's just some sitcom. I knew better to watch Two and a Half Men with Charlie Sheen. Right. I mean, I knew better to watch that. This seems a little more subtle. In order to go through your deliverance, you've got to have the same mindset as when God passed the mantle from Moses to Joshua, and they're about to go in and possess the promised land. They're about to take new territory. They're about to uh, have the promises that God promised the people of God. And he tells them, you've got to do this. In Joshua 1.9, he says, you've got to be strong, and you've got to be of good courage. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So in order to go through deliverance, you can't have any doubt and unbelief. You can't be afraid. You can't operate in fear. God's going to deliver you. Are, are all the spirits going to come out in one day? They're not. There's going to be a process, but the process is designed by God. It's initiated by God, and he's brought you through this process to whatever level you leave here at. And he's going to finish the work that he begins, but some things you have to be able to see. I probably couldn't have saw that as a, as a business Christian where I was 90% business, 10% ministry, I wouldn't have ever been able to look at these things and say, hey, that's sin, and you could pick up demons. I mean, I could easily look at porn and say, hey, you look at that, you're going to be in trouble. You head down to the strip club, you're going to pick up some lust spirits. But God's ways are, are a lot thinner and a lot narrower than we assume. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in the first verse, it says this, And you were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and one, when you once walked, according to what? The course of this world. This world's on a course. They're on a course of happiness, of financial security, of good times, entertainment, uh, the easy road security. They got to have those things in place to make themselves feel good. According to the course of this world, and look who puts it into operation. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the in the sons of disobedience, among whom you also once conducted yourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So he's going to work what? Against your flesh, and he's going to operate against your mind. You got saved when you were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. You weren't sanctified until whatever age. He's going to bring you right back into that area and that life that seems really comfortable. But if you're going to really be a disciple of Jesus, which every believer is to grow and to become a disciple, you're going to have to cleanse yourself of all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit to be a vessel of nobility. Otherwise, hey, you're just going to be a guy that can do a little here and there. He can get something, a fruitful experience. He'll always send you mercy and encouragement. He'll always send you a person of desperation, an opportunity for someone that doesn't know the Word of God to hear the Word of God. He's a merciful God. You can always have encounters, even as a lukewarm Christian with God, because he's always trying to stir you up to press on, to press on to the biblical things that he's called you to do. But we're going to have to listen. Now we know in verse 8, we're saved by grace. Are you saved by your deliverance? Are you saved by your your biblical knowledge and all. No, you're saved by grace. For it is by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So I'm saved by a gift of God. You don't think I'm going to be delivered by a gift of God? Absolutely, it's going to be a gift. It's not by works. At least anyone should boast. For we are what? His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's already got something planned for you. 
And I really believe in America that I would, I would assume that a very small percent ever walked in those gifts. Because doubt and unbelief and fear is so powerful. Because in this world, let's be honest, hey, I, I haven't seen anyone in here that can be a model. You're not going to make it. You're not going to be a Forbes uh, model and have a nice six, seven figure contract. We, we didn't have any professional athletes in the house. We're, we're not heading down to the Suns and getting on the 12-man roster. Uh, the odds of you owning uh, one of these high rises down in Central Phoenix are slim but none. And so this world has a way to advance. Someone that's super intelligent or super charismatic, someone that's, someone that's super beautiful or athletically gifted, they can just kind of cream, they can just kind of accelerate like you can't believe. And we all grow up in that. We grow up in that from kindergarten when you're going to class and you see little cliques developing. You see on the athletic field, there's some kids, hey, the ball's not thrown to you. Hey, you're not asked to be quarterback. And so we start kind of having this mindset of what you can do and what you can't do. And, and who you're going to become in the business world or, or in the athletic realm, it, it's already kind of set in play based off your natural talents. And I believe there's some people that can rise above and do some wonderful things and get an insight, an ability to create something from God, uh, the ability just to persevere and prosper. I'm not saying this is, this is law, but this is kind of how the world works. And so when you become a Christian, and, and I used to look at some guys and I'd say, wow, man, this guy can really rip. Wow, that's a preacher. You know, Rod Parsley, this guy can just get up there and he'll quote you 50 verses. He's memorized them all. He's got, I think he used to sing. I don't think he sings anymore. But the guy used to even be able to sing. And so you look at these super talented Christians and you start kind of evaluating your, your mind, in your mind, what kind of Christian you're going to be. But that has nothing to do with the Bible. That has nothing to do with God, what God has preordained for you. And I've seen people bear some fruit that few ministers in the valley can do. I, few ministers can lay hands on people and get them healed. Few ministers can cast out demons. And I've seen sex offenders who got forgiven, delivered, and filled with the Holy Ghost doing these things that the Bible says that we would all do. And so you have to have a mindset that God's positioning you, especially in these last days when I believe things are going to get hard. In order for things to get really hard, it's got to get really good and then stoop really low. If you forgot about it, you better talk to someone who was around in 2009 and 10. But this new generation of college grads, they were in college. They were in high school when all that thing went down. They're off to the races. They're borrowing Peter to pay Paul. They're building this project and that project. They're believing there's no end to it. But the reality is there's highs and there's lows. And when this when the next low comes, there's people that are desperate. There's people that are hurting. And uh, there's going to be some times when... People are going to need God. In order to find God, they're going to have to run into the people of God. And those people can be you if you choose to get yourself ready. You can be a part of the harvest. You can be a part of doing some wonderful things for God. But you got to get yourself cleansed. you got to get over yourself. you got to get over your failures and your deficiencies. you got to get over these abuses and these terrible things that happen to you, these broken marriages, these divorces, these abuses, uh, you name it. So we got to overcome Going down, let's see, uh, verse 16. And he's reconciling them both to God in one body on the cross. He's putting to death the enmity. Ooh, that's, that's done away with. God's not mad at you. God's always encouraging you, looking to help you. Looking to say, hey, I don't care if you've messed your life up for 75 years. You can turn this around today and your 76 can get good. It's a mindset of just completely turning your life over to God. And he says, and he came and he preached peace to those who were afar and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You got access to the Father. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That means I don't need a mediator of a, of a preacher and a teacher. I don't, I don't need to get to Benny Hinn when he comes to town to get my miracle once a year. I got access to the Father and the Father's got every miracle I ever needed. And so he's looking to help you out. Um, and then he's building us together. Verse 21. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. In order to be built together, there has to be some order. And if you go to a church, I don't care if it's Mickey Mouse is the pastor. Well, he's in authority. 
And the minute you start grumbling and complaining and despising his authority, nitpicking him, well, you've just blocked your ability to hear from God because God speaks through his word. That means if anybody picks up the word, Paul says, and it's proclaimed, somebody can get saved, somebody can get healed, somebody can get edified. I, I get some of my best messages at churches, and I say, oh, this is how you preach it. The Holy Ghost teaches me, and I come together with some great messages, even though the message I heard was missing some of the key points that the Holy Spirit brought to me. So there's an order. There's an order to your family. And, uh, and I don't care if your husband failed a million times. The minute he's in your house and he's your husband and not divorced, God has positioned him to be the head of the household. And once you try to be the Holy Ghost, nitpicking him in the order, all you do is drive him from you and God. It'll never work. It'll never work. And uh, men, if you're going to lead... You got to lead by example. You got to do these things which God's called you to do. You got to rise up. I don't care. My wife knew the word of God. She was saved at 14. I was saved at 23 years old. And she knew the word of God. And uh, look, it doesn't mean I'm not to lead her because she started first and she had this big, uh, uh, you know, decade of growth spiritually. The minute I get saved, God starts showing me and I start being faithful with what I know. Number one, I got to get in the word of God. Number two, I got to fellowship with people. Number three, I got to pray. These are the days where you can't get by without praying. I got by without praying sometimes. I can't do that anymore. I mean, I've tried to, I've tried to cut corners. I've tried to do things my way. And in the end, I always end up getting caught. I don't care what it is. It's, it's a matter of time before your sin finds you out. And it, you will be exposed, and it will always cost you something. And I'm not talking always a gross sin of adultery or ripping off somebody in a business. I'm talking about just the sin of compromising, not doing the things and being in the order you're supposed to be in. There has to be an order in here. Mike's the leader of this place. And so, for instance, I was trying to meet with these guys because of our problem on Thursday, and I tried to schedule my Tuesday, you know, as I saw fit. And it turns out he didn't see that email, but he said, hey, you're on for one, three, and five. Bang, bang, bang. And I said, okay, hey, scratch that. He's in charge. I got to recalibrate. And if I got to be here earlier or be here later. But, you know, it turns out a few minutes later, he goes, oh, I didn't see that. Okay, I'll give John your five and whatever. But the reality is you got to be willing to make some changes to be in alignment. And the minute you're in alignment as the body of Christ, God can raise you up. But when you're out of alignment, God's not going to bless you when you're sinning. He's not going to bless you when you're out of order in the body of Christ. Because if you start receiving those blessings, then you're going to start thinking you can get blessed by God by doing any old thing you want in any order you want. But God has an order to this thing, and we need to get in alignment with it so that we can be blessed and fulfill our calling. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in the fourth verse. He says this, he says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed. Some people would swear in those counseling sessions that they were sweating blood. But no, not according to scripture. You have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. He said, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when he re are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you get Joel Osteen preaching that, please send me the video. I got to see that. You're going to be disciplined as a Christian. Some of the discipline is, okay, you gave sin place. You, you wouldn't forgive. You, you get turned over to the tormentors. Who's the tormentors? The demons. And you pay every last penny before you're released. What's the last penny? Giving up the, the, the bitterness and the rejection and forgiving the person, forgiving yourself. Yeah, you blew all your money. You've been to nine rehabs. You drug your mother through hell and then back again. you got to forgive yourself or you can't go on. You're going to be turned over to the tormentors and you're going to wonder why now these mystery illnesses are springing up in your body. You're going to be chastened. You're going to be rebuked. Ooh, why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Hey, I had to... I had to give my son a little bit of that today. Someone in leadership, in part of the athletics where he is, and my son looks up to him a lot, he got caught in adultery. And uh, he, you know, he said some things out of line, and I'm kind of studying. He goes, man, I didn't know he was a player like that. My wife goes, I don't think that's a player. I think he's getting played. 
And he tries to flip it because he's feeling guilty. He goes, well, if you ever gotten caught in adultery, I'd be all over you so hard, you wouldn't know what to do. And, uh, and uh, he's kind of doing a joke, and it's not as hard as he's a pretty soft kid. He's the kid that was crying two weeks ago on the phone. So it's not as hard as I put it into drama there. But he's joking with my mom, and my mom said, or his mom says, uh, well, what would you do if dad ever got caught in adultery? And he said, ooh, I'd get with that, and we'd have to keep that on the down low. And so, look, there's a way that you pick up from this world, no matter how much Bible and how much prayer you had, to think that you are not going to get chastened and disciplined by God. Let me tell you, it, it is not going well. It is not going well. I know a good minister, and I, and I knew his ministry before he was arrested as a sex offender. And this guy was a career military guy, retired with a full pension, good guy. When he got a divorce from his wife, he showed up in Las Vegas where he was from. And there was 100000 in a 401k, and uh, he was sitting down, and he didn't bring his lawyer. And the lawyer goes, you don't have any representation over this matter of this 100000 in the 401k? And he says, no. And he says, well, this is what we think. And he's just trying to gobble the biggest percent he can, and he goes, you know what? God told me in prayer just to give it to my, my ex-wife. Just give it to her. And he gave it to her. This guy was a good guy, and uh, he was just comfortable with some porn. He said, he said look, I, I wouldn't do this thing repetitiously. He said, I'm talking two, three, four times a year at best. And he had a girlfriend, and every once in a while she was from out of town, and he'd stay down in the basement. Well, it turns out she had some teenage daughters. And one day after watching porn, he decides he's going to peek in the shower and see her. And uh, he never got caught. The conviction so on him, he calls the police on himself. The cop goes, I've never seen anyone like you. But, hey, I, don't, I think you've learned your lesson here. But I have to turn this over to the district attorney, and they have one year to file charges. I just got to let you know. Two days before that year was up, they came and arrested him. And his ministry is over. And uh, I haven't seen him... Uh, he had some plans, and he t I saw him one time afterwards. He said, hey, even the church, I was ministering, and there was a minister coming in the jail that was uh, another service other than mine, and he went there, and he wanted to become a member, and the, the uh, board or whoever said, hey, we're not, we just can't have you. I mean, that's what a little bit of something will do to you. It will take more than you're willing to give up. He'll make you pay more than you're willing to give every time and so look my, my son had to realize I had to sit him down like look if, if I ever cheated or my wife ever cheated hell's coming to breakfast but they don't know the first the person that gets hurt the most is the kids I know the minute I fornicate on my wife everything I taught my kids is going right to the dumpster and they're going to relearn what they want to learn according to that wound on their soul for if you endure chastening, so that means some people don't want to endure it, God deals with you as sons, for what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate sons. If you're going to a church and you don't think God's going to discipline you and raise your standard of holiness, you think you just inherently just downloaded the DNA of God and you are just a holy person, and there's nothing comes your way. <laughs> You've fallen into this category. No, not holiness. Illegitimate and not true sons. We all go through discipline. And discipline is tough. He says, furthermore, we all had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. How much more ready to be in subjection to the father of spirits and live. For indeed, for a few days chastened us as seemed to be best for to them for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness no one chastening seems to be in joy for the present but painfully nevertheless afterwards it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it well how do you get trained by it well when you lose all your money when you lose your marriage, when you lose your business, when you lose your peace, when you lose your joy, when you lose your hope and your desperation for God, then you sit down 
and you let God have his full way. You give him your full attention. Then we can grow from there. James 4 and 10, he says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. That's the key. He's got to be on the throne. He's got to be in charge of your life. I know you're, some of you are super Christian, but even super Christians have to be completely subjected to the Lord and his will. This is how this thing works. If you start looking at uh, being made humble, whew, you can be forced to be humble through scripture. You can be brought low and you can be known by God only from afar. And you can be resisted because of your pride. James, uh, Matthew, rather, 32, 12, he says, whoever exalts himself, he will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. That's why you don't have to kick and fight for your ministry. And that's why you got to just look for some open doors. Yeah, I believe you got to seek and you find. I believe you got to knock doors, get open. You got to ask in order to receive. But you don't have to. You don't have to fight that ladder like you do in the corporate world. You don't have to fight that ladder like you do in the sports world. Hey, I knew a lot of guys that got some playing time uh, who were just tough guys. And they did everything they were supposed to do at the right place at the right time. And they were tough. And they superseded some guys that had some better athletic ability. That were some four-star athletes, some super state California players. But, hey, that doesn't work in the spirit world. You don't fight and, and claw for that. You trust God. First Peter 5 and 5, he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. There's something about submitting to authority. It's kind of funny in here. You would think in your natural mind when you're messing with demons, this would be the first place you'd want to be humbled. So you don't get your face kicked in. I mean, it's kind of a, a carnival show of what demons do to people. I mean, I've seen the craziest stuff. I've seen a guy look normal. I said, wow, this guy looks pretty together. He proceeded at the altar call to put his rear up in the air and his face on the ground and his hands behind his body and drag his face across the altar. I would look at demons manifesting people pu puking and hacking and screaming like, hey, you better get in order in this place. But yet you, you'll find some people wanting to jump around and do their own thing. And there's an order. There's an order. You got to, hey, I, I started this whole thing. I, I did. One day I was going home. I was already on the 51 at the old house of healing. And Holy Spirit said, go back and take the trash out. Well, our trash is not like normal trash. Whatever trash is left here is put into that trash. And then you got to pick that trash up and walk that out to some kind of uh, dumpster. And there tends to be some fluids on the edge of that bag that you don't know where they came from or what's on them. It's not a pleasant job. But the Holy Spirit told me to do it. And so I sat back and I just watched for a while and I just I just saw how the whole thing was where I didn't want to tread in some ground that God wasn't leading me to I, I was already ran over by demons I had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the market had got into a business deal with a partner who turned on me stabbed me in the back and got a lawyer to help him do it I had already lost my joy and my hope I almost lost my ministry I wasn't about to get out on my own and do this again when it comes to full-on fighting demons and so there has to be an authority in what you're doing and even at your home group, if someone's leading that home group, it isn't you, Mr. Bible Know-It-All, to bark a bunch of, you know, clarity into his head and take over that, that, that Bible study. You wait for your spot. You wait for the Holy Spirit to give you an open door. You pray for those people that weren't getting the word. You take them to the side at the end of that thing and say, hey, I think I have a, a little more clarity. I, I wondered if you got that fully. Here's what it meant to me. You, 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 you go serve. And... Uh, and you get in alignment so God can raise you up. Amen. That's the problem with YouTube. Oh, YouTube has no governing body uh, for most of these YouTube preachers. So you're out here on your own, and now they can make some money. You get paid per click. You can put an advertising something on there. Well, these guys get out on their own. Some of them don't, but some of them do. And you start rising up in this level uh, in the spirit, there's different kind of demons. You're going to pick up a different kind of demon over here at Hamburger Works drinking a beer than you are down here at, at, at some rowdy club where people are partying and doing drugs on the down low, etc. You're going to, there's different levels of spirits. And you start rising up and you're out of, with no authority, no prayer. I have all those jail, jail guys praying for me. I said, hey, you're going to forget about me. 
You're going to duck and dive when you see me. You won't want to see me. You'll, you'll just duck out some days. I know they do it all the time when you see me. Like, ah, I'm doing good and not that good. I don't want Rick hammering me. I know they duck out. But I say, hey, just remember me in prayer. I need you. We need your prayer. Who are we, a bunch of super Christians? We're just a bunch of people like you that went through deliverance and, and bought into, hey, I'm supposed to help somebody, and i got to go ahead and labor to do it because this is not an easy job. And if people aren't praying for us, we're not a church. We don't have a board of directors. We don't have women that's been here for 50, 60, 70 years that are praying for the, the men of God and leadership. You know, this, we're, we're standing on the prayers uh, of the people that's been touched before. And so... It's key if you're going to grow to be in this order, to be humble, to be humble. Luke 1.52, he says, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and he exalted the lowly. You can be exalted quick. Psalms 138 and 6, though the Lord is on high, he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. There's a lot of people, they don't got a quick response, prayer response with God. They don't have it. And they're stumbling around. They're looking for a word. They're looking for some prophet. You got a word for me? Oh, man, I went to this one guy. Man, I can't remember his name. He used to be on right after Mike. He was from New York City. Anybody remember what that preacher's name was? He's, just, he's an older guy from New York. Well, I went to his little hotel crusade one time. And, man, when he was giving out these words, people were like puppy dogs. He's giving out words, and they lined up like, oh, please, man of God, I need a word in such yeah. desperation. Yeah. And I was thinking, dude, if this gives, guy gives me a word, i got to confirm this thing with two or three more yeah. witnesses. I can't take off with this word. And then people were lining up uh, to give money that got the word. Like, oh, I want this word to be real, so real, I'm going to give a gift. So, the Lord, you make this thing come true. It's not how it works. You need a word. Here's, your, here's the word right here. Humble yourself. Get in line with the word of God. Start surrounding yourself with, with some other believers. Are other believers perfect? No. No. Hey, I, I get around Christians. They encourage me all the time. Kelly encourages me. She, she's been helping my son out. I go over there, and Kelly's the same person when she came in six years ago, or five years ago, as right now. She's completely humble. She knows all kinds of things. She'll kick out demons that I can't get out. If I can't get them out, I send people to Kelly. I'd say, hey, you need to go see that lady over there. I don't know what's wrong with you. She'll help you. But she's not proud. She's not thinking. She was telling me the other day, hey, I got these family members. Ah, they're Christians. I want them to get delivered. I'm so hungry to see them get delivered so God can come and do this miracle. Well, she's not some mighty Christian. Like, I'm just going to break the word on them. I'm going to yank those devils right out of them. She knows those people get delivered when God sets up the divine opportunity and those people trust you. And then you give that word in love. Then you can see that door opened up and see those miracles happen to your family members. I tried to go into my family, and, and uh, I had got born again. I had quit selling tickets. I was moving, and some just stuff getting off me, like unbelievable. And I went back to Nebraska, and, and uh, this thing went bad. I mean, it went bad from the beginning. My dad's kind of wrestling with it, but he's like, you know, you, of all people, bringing me the word, I kind of rubbed him the wrong way. All the trouble and all the failure and all the heartbreak I caused him. Then I asked my mom, if she's a Christian, she begins to weep and cry. Have I been this bad of mother that you would think I'm not a Christian? And she's crying. My dad's like, what the heck are you doing? He's yelling at me. And, uh, and I'm thinking, hey, I've lived in here for 19 years, I can kind of know we aren't biblical Christians. You know, you sending me to church with a, a bag of Captain Crunch till I was 12 to get me through the service on Easter and Christmas is not quite Christian. It gets even worse. We go to church, and my dad smokes two packs of Lucky Strikes, non-filter, every day. The whole house. I mean, we were those kids that smelled like smoke. I mean, I'd come to school, and teacher's like, does someone smell smoke? And I'd just lay low like, oh, man, please don't, don't boy me out. It's my clothes. And so I crack up, open the screen door about this much so some air can come in when we go to church. 
I come back, and my mother's cat's head is in there. Oh. She is not moving at all. It can only get its head in. It must have kicked itself crazy till it just straight passed out. And it's just a cat, just limp with the head. I go and I take it out. My mom hits the floor. I didn't know she loved that cat that much. She never cried when my dog died. I didn't think she was going to cry. She hits the floor like my little brother had just been ran over by a bus. She's down there crying to God. And I don't know what to do. But I had seen an animal channel one time when they breathed into an animal's life and he came back. So I grabbed the cat by his mouth. And I start, I take two breaths. And I breathe into the cat's lungs. And in the, after the second breath, it sneezed. Hallelujah. It came back to life and it just died last year. It lived to be 23 years old. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's no Andrew Womack raising his son from the dead, but God got me out of a jam. So the first time I go there, I leave there and I'm thinking, man, I thought my whole family was going to get saved. I thought they were going to receive the gospel. I thought this thing was all going to work out just great. I was going to leave. My family was going to be in the book of life. But it took a little time and I didn't grow weary. First person I got saved was my brother. He was 13 years old at that time. Second person I got was my dad. My dad was always angry. He had mental illness. They put experiment drugs in him all the time from the VA hospital. And then I'm sitting there with my dad, and my dad would see me helping people. He would see that I had joy. He saw that I was different. This is now a year, maybe two years later. And I began to now open the Bible, show him these verses. And I said, Dad, you got to get saved. And God showed up there and humbled him so much. And he said, you're not tricking me, are you, son? I really got to get saved. I really got to receive Jesus. I said, it's right here. And he looked at my 13-year-old brother. He said, Ryan, he said, you got to pray it with me then. And my brother, anointing's on him. He says, no, dad, I already prayed that prayer. You got to pray it for yourself. Amen. My dad got saved. My brother got saved. My aunt ended up getting saved. Lifetime lesbian. Uh, tore up from lupus. Uh, kidney transplant. God saved my uncle had received Jesus after he was going to shoot up his workplace with a nine millimeter. Uh, so God will do some miracles if you just stay, stay faithful and stay loving and knowing that the good you're doing is always making an impact on people. Whether you see their response or not, they're watching you. They're watching to see your life, to see if it exemplifies, if it's, if it's an alignment with the Bible. But when you're outside and you're living your old kind of way, it doesn't matter how much biblical knowledge you have. It doesn't matter. Guys in the jail, there's, there's people that are pastors. There's people who's been to pastor college. They'll take a rookie and make him the table leader if he's humble. If, he's, if he loves God and he's faithful. And those will only be the faithful ones. The other guys won't show up on time. And uh, if you're faithful, God will raise you up and you'll see some miracles in your family. I promise you. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit, he'll retain honor. John chapter 10, verse 11 through 16, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives life for his sheep, but the hireling who is not the shepherd, he does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees. For the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's not, because he is a hireling, and he does not care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I must also bring. They hear my voice, and there is one flock, and there is one shepherd. So God is a good God. He's led you here. And you've had to taste some chastening of the Lord. You had to taste some failures. You had to taste... Some lukewarm times of your life to get hungry, to get to a point where you have this sold out conviction to God. And uh, it's not easy. It is not easy. This flesh has got a mind of its own. This world has a course that you've trained yourself on for years. And to come out and think a different way and do something different and your only reward is in heaven. Hey, there was no reward when I sowed the seed. Hey, I did not count a cat living 
as a reward. <laughs> to me, I, there would have been no uh, tears shed if that cat would have been dead right there. I would have picked him up and put him right in the trash can and ate dinner. <laughs> that was not my reward. My reward came later. Yeah, that was uh, a seed when I was sharing the word of God. Even though there was trouble, even though it wasn't received in the way that I anticipated, nevertheless, the seed was planted when I was proclaiming the word of God. When I was telling them, we, you got to be born again. I've been born again. God has done something in my life. I know he's real and he's called me to something. That's why I can't sell these tickets anymore. When I left that business, everyone told me not to do it. Hey, you, you'll never have money like this. Hey, you try to sell tickets now, it's over. That thing's a stub hub. They control 90% of that market. But back then, you could control, it was easy as pie. I mean, ASU played in Nebraska, in Nebraska, sold out for 10 years straight. I could come down to ASU when it's released, and I could buy as many as I wanted for face value. Two months later, I could head to the ASU game at Nebraska, and now they're worth three times, four times what you paid. It was easy. But God was telling me, I'm not there. And I had all these voices tell me, hey, don't leave. You'll never make money like this. But God was leading me. He is a sovereign God. He'll lead you by his Holy Spirit. He's a good shepherd. Yeah. He said, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep, one of them goes astray? Will he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one straying? He's went to the mountains to go find you. <laughs> he hasn't been just waiting for you and allowing you to play pinball in the world and get smacked around for no reason. He's been looking for you. And unfortunately, we do have to taste some hard times. I would not have been the man I am today if I wouldn't have lost my money. Because my money was, gave me my identity. Man, I knew you could be ugly, and you got money, you have a fine wife. You got money, and it doesn't matter what kind of jokes you got. You got friends. Money is a cure in my mind to all your problems. And so I thought, hey, if I got money, I'm set. And that gets taken away. That's the rug of which you were standing on, which was not Jesus Christ. And when streams rise and storms beat against that, it came crashing down. Well, it comes crashing down when it goes away. It's over. And so I had to look at my life and say, well, who am I really? What am I really doing? What is my life really? What am I called to do? Yeah, I do some good things. I had led a couple thousand people to Jesus, as a matter of fact. I had a good jail ministry. Been doing it for 17 years. But I wasn't getting people delivered from demons. I wasn't seeing the supernatural power of God flow through my hands to see people healed from infirmities and diseases. I had no ability to bifurcate uh, someone that needed a healing if it was demonic and it needed to be cast out or if it was just something that they needed a healing. I didn't understand all those things until I got into the Word of God, until I sat under Brother Mike's teaching and I just sat there every week listening and saying, okay, now hey, I, not only do I have to listen to this, I got to do it now. It's a scary thing when you're forever hearing the word of God and you don't do it. You've been going to church for a long time. Hey, man, church ain't going to help you. You'd be better off taking yourself down the block and just praying for a few people, helping somebody out. You can get churched out and there can be a real deception that comes upon you when you get in the habit of just being entertained by Christian leaders and you don't do it. We're supposed to hear this thing and do this thing. Because when... He says, well, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. Ooh, isn't that the key to everything we want? You want this. You want that. You want to have this. You want your ministry now. Well, he's going to lead you to those green pastures. He's going to take you by some still waters. He's going to restore your soul. But first, he has to lead you in the paths of righteousness. The Christians are the funniest people in the world. Like you get in the ticket business. Everybody wants to learn. Hey, teach me how to do this thing. How does this thing work? You get to Arizona State University and every freshman, I was there when Jake Plummer came. He was a freshman when I was declared ineligible. But I was on that team until they finally said, hey, Rick, you got to go to South Dakota. It's over for you, buddy. I had to go to a Division two. But every freshman shows up like this. Like, you know, man, you, know, well, you best believe four years, five years of lifting weights are way bigger than they are. And the freshman class was Juan Roque, uh, that center Robinson. Juan Roque became All-American. He never blocked me one time. Not one time. I refused. One time I was in a slump on one-on-ones. I went against him. I said, dude, if I lose here, this thing is going downhill. <laughs> Those guys all had to learn. No matter how. That guy went on to be a second-round draft choice. Uh, Jake Plummer went on to be a first-round draft choice. Everybody has to learn. But Christians have this mindset, oh, I'm saved. 
I'm saved. I'm somebody special. God's just going to bless me coming and bless me going, and I can do no wrong. And then when you start walking in that attitude, then sin doesn't seem so uh, bad for you because you're somebody special now. You're not going to get a sting. Oh, I'm a Christian. It gets so special. you got a whole group of these Christians. Oh, I'm a Christian. I can't have demons. Oh, they no, they can't touch me. I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. How could darkness and light be in the same vessel? Because the Bible said, if light be in you and darkness, whoa, how great's the darkness. Who's in charge now? Because a man can't serve two masters. You're a slave unto the one you serve. You think a Christian can't be a slave? Come on, man. What makes you a Christian? Leading 500 people to Jesus, seeing some divine miracles. I seen born again Christians forget they were even saved until they were locked into solitary confinement. I, I, I man, I, you, we deal with people that have been doing meth. Are you kidding me? What makes you a Christian? Someone comes in here, they go through deliverance, they cast out some demons, they get four or five people going through the deliverance process, and they go back to sin. What are they? Were they never Christians? Yeah, they were Christians, but they did not do what God called them to do: is to resist this devil. You got to resist him. You're not going to ever face anything that's too big for you. I mean, there's probably some too big things for us. You know, someone called up and said, you know what? We found out you're actually the cousin to Bill Bedwell. And you know what? He left a quarter of the Cardinals to you. It's going to cost you 16 hours a day to manage this thing. But hey, there'll be millions of dollars. It's not going to come. That's not going to choke your time. What comes to choke all your time was something you could have handled and opened that door and escaped. That's what's coming your way. Nothing that is uncommon to man. That's uncommon to you. It's the same old tricks coming to you. Because ultimately, First Peter talks about, because the chief shepherd is going to appear, and we're going to receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. If you really love God, if you really believe the word of God, my rewards aren't on this earth. I'm not getting a mansion. I'm not going to ever need a security detail. I might need a couple of accountability brothers to follow me around, but I'm not going to need no security detail. It's just not as, look, this thing is, is going through deliverance and defeating the devil. Yeah, he's defeated at the cross of Calvary. Jesus defeated him, but you got to defeat him. The minute you receive the Holy Spirit, the minute Jesus received the Holy Spirit, it says the Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. So what happens to all these jail guys? They come out and they think he's under their feet. No, there was limited temptation in jail. We didn't have any porn. We had no chicks in there. Uh, you're not a homosexual, so there was no sexual deviance going on in there. Uh, you weren't filling your mind with godless stuff because you had desperation. Now you get out. Now you got to face this devil. Now you got to face him face to face with no one knowing. I've heard a hundred stories. You won't believe it, dude. I, I, I got out. I found drugs. Something just said, look down in there. Matter of fact, I did when I was in seventh grade. I was waiting for someone. Someone said, someone said pick up that cigarette pack. And I said, well, I don't smoke cigarettes. I walked around waiting for someone to show up. 20 minutes later, I opened it up. And there's a bag of weed in there. So many times this stuff happens. This devil, he's playing for real. And he can move the natural realm. And he can put stuff there. And who put it there? Did he, you know, fly on his demonic wings and put it there? No, somebody lost it that he made, you know, be forgetful just because he knew you'd be passing by. And he's a smart devil. He knows how to set up adultery uh, and hit you when you're weak. Oh, who, who finds you when you're hurting? Oh, a man that'll listen. Oh, he's just a listener. He's a kind man. Oh, my goodness. That devil, you got to see him coming from a long way away. Watch this. Now, the Holy Spirit will never discourage you. You have to realize God's voice. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to lead you around. He's going to lead. It's not Jesus. Jesus is the right hand of the Father. He's coming again to judge. He's not here leading you around. The Father's never been here. Jesus came down and, and became a man. He's going to send from the right hand of the Father the Holy Spirit, the counselor. And it says the counselor is the helper. He's never going to discourage you. So if you're dealing with discouragement, that's not God. Now, he'll discipline you, and he'll allow you to taste some, some hardships and some heartbreaks and some losses, but ultimately, he's trying to encourage you to come back home to him so he can help you. Okay, so you got to learn his voice. In John chapter 14, verse 16, he says, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. So he's the helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. 
So if you're going to be led by the spirit of truth, you think you can walk in lies and compromise and discord and out of order? There's no way you're walking with the Holy Ghost. That's contrary to Scripture. God is always faithful to His Word. He performs His Word. He's not going to allow you to have the performance of God's blessings out of order. So when He comes, He's going to be with you forever, the spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive because it, can't, it doesn't see Him or it doesn't know Him. But you know Him because He dwells in you and He will be in you. And so... The Holy Spirit comes, and we all know the th main things that he does. We are all excited about that. He fills us, he empowers us, and he equips us with spiritual gifts. Well, that's great. We all, we, we all got to be filled. We all got to be empowered. We all got to get these spiritual gifts. And then ultimately, he bears fruit through us in Galatians. But what we have to be remindful in order for these things to happen is he's a reminder, John 14. He convicts us, John 16. He comforts us. Well, what's he got to comfort for you if you're only going to have a cookie and cream lifestyle like these preachers tell you? you got to be comforted because there's hardship and loss and pain in a sin-stained world. And it jumps off on you and it, and it always hurts. So you have to be comforted. And then he what? He teaches us. Oh, if you know it all, why would you have to be taught by the teacher? We're always learning. We're always growing. And the minute you stop, hey, man, you chose to get out of alignment because he's got enough to teach you. That it's funny when I I got a little third ministry and it's called the LA Fitness Sauna. And I get to preach it in there. And I don't know if it's a defense mechanism to get some creepy guy off your back or so I look or whatever, but I started talking about God and they go, Oh, I know God. I know him. No need to preach to me, I know him. You know God, a God that always was and has no end. He has no end. When you're first a Christian, you go, wow, what if we're in heaven and something starts to break? What if something starts to just fizzle out and we dis mass disintegrate? It's like, whoa, are you sure you got it, God? You can put all this into existence and it will never die. We'll never have sorrow. We'll never have any weeping. There'll never be any death. I mean, come on. God is a, speaks something out of nothing. He creates something, reaches down into dirt. Oh, I'm, I'm, I know God. We, we reach down in the dirt. You'd be lucky to make a little, a little mud hut. You know, he reaches down in the dirt and forms a man made in his image. Breathes on him and the breath of life comes into him. And he becomes a living soul. So the minute we stop growing in the knowledge of God, and we've taken ourselves out of alignment because there's a whole lot more to learn. I mean, we get around, hey, YouTube's incredible. I watch YouTube. There's some guys that get some revelation you can't believe. Might get some revelation like you can't believe. I started thinking about titling my, uh, Ron said, what are you going to title your message? And I was thinking, wow, you know, Mike, uh, he used to do Tuesdays, the deep things of God. I mean, it was incredible. I, I was thinking, man, I'm going to be teaching the simplest things of God. <laughs> this is as simple as it gets. And, and hey, it's all working for good. Mike's at home. He's able to do some studying. He's able to go into that word and, and get some more revelation and, and to take us deeper into uh, the things of God and, and knowledge of him. But it's the simple things. We got to be reminded. We got to be convicted. We got to be comforted. Hey, the first thing that happens, it says two or three times in the New Testament, do not quench the spirit. That devil, when he was causing all that pain, of those altar calls getting shut down, of coming to the halfway house and there was all that trouble. What he was trying to do was quench the spirit. He knew I was on fire. We had a, a victory in my son's life. As a father, you can't wait for these spiritual victories and these things that you'll never forget. And that wrestling was a, a great teaching tool to keep him humble and to, and to put him in that order to be a, a servant, not to glorify himself. And then we had a nice service here and that incredible miracle that happened in the jails where God sent me these three people just miraculously. Well, now he knew that was a, a fire inside of me and he had to let it cool off. No altar calls for you. And, and even the guard, when he shut it down, I said, okay, can we have 15 minutes for prayer? He goes, nope, it's over now. And I said, hey, okay, he's in charge. We got to go, guys. God, they're all, oh, man, they, they're not even common to that. Then when I left, he goes, he goes, hey, sorry about that, man. Like he looked like he was confused why he shut it down so hard. And then the other one, that's all the devil's waiting to do is try to take away your fire. That's what he wants to do. Once that anointing comes on you, that anointing, you can, you can, it can, it can fade down. 
things aren't always perfect. Ministries aren't always perfect. Marriages are always perfect. And you can slowly just fizzle out that flame. See, that flame, that's why Paul told Timothy, he said, you got to fan that flame to keep this fire. You, this thing is not common. You don't just ride with this like this is all, any old kind of thing. You get the anointing rolling for your deliverance, and you keep this thing going. You keep that thing going to, tomorrow. You keep that thing. You don't just, oh, I, on Thursdays, I'm down at the house of healing getting delivered. No, we don't play around with six days in between. You keep that thing going. You keep yourself hungry and allow God to do what he wants to do. Each one of us is tempted in James 1.14 and drawn away, talking to Christians, by his own desires and he's enticed. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. Oh, he's got a, this is the enemy's plan. Right here is that you don't deal with this stuff in your heart. There's some stuff that used to be in my heart that's not there anymore. It's, it's not there. I used to not trust myself. I used to say, ooh, I didn't even really minister to women, not good-looking women. I said, hey, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't want to be around them too much. I mean, I'm looking at them all the time. I don't know what could happen. And I had to get it out of there. Had to get out. Why didn't I want to get it out of there? Because of good looking girls like you, all my life since I was 12, you got instant value. You got instant cred with all the guys when you got beautiful women. That's why every rich man has a trophy wife. That's what that is. Hey, I got value and I'm to be respected. Yeah, you, you didn't respect my athleticism. Respect this. And it works in this world. It's real. And so I picked up this way to see women that was, certainly was not biblical, it was sinful. And then I finally, one day, I'm at my hot dog cart, and there's a psychic convention over at Phoenix Civic Plaza. And there's really pretty girls coming, and she's buying some food, and, and I don't know what I said. I said, well, where are you going? Um, she looked really nervous. She goes, oh, I'm going over to the psychic convention. And I said, really? What are you looking to find over there? She goes, we have a sister that died at 12, and we want to know why God allowed this to happen. Why did this happen? Why did he take her at 12 years old? And instantly, when you got the Holy Ghost, he'll jump on somebody. So he supersedes all those fears and lies that were pumped up into my mind. And I said, hey, you know what? Let me show this verse. I don't know what verse it was, but I went right down to no divinator, no consultant with familiar spirits in Deuteronomy or something. Well, in air, you know, all this judgment. I said, this person's not from God. I said, there's one mediator between a sinful man and a holy God. His name is Jesus. You can ask Jesus. First of all, God didn't take that, that, that daughter away at that early age. It says the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He took her. That's all you need to know. And after that happened, I said, oh, my goodness. I said, my ministry is really limited. I was a guy's guy. I had no problem. I'd break the word down. I used to sell art. I Pro athletes, I led a guy to the Lord, a $12 million house, and he was busted and had been out of the NFL first time in 12 years. I had no problem saying anything to any man. I had zero fear. I was a ticket scalper. Fear does not work. So I didn't have fear of women. I had a fear of myself, not trusting myself. And I said, hey, this can't work. This cannot work. I can't have lust in my eyes. And that, that's got to go. That's got to go. I got to see women, and it's supernatural. The only way you can see women as a sister and as a mother, as the Bible tells you, is if God gives you eyes to see. He has to give you eyes to see. Otherwise, this flesh just looks at flesh. And then the value of a woman is based on the beauty of her flesh. It's completely, you know, a, a lie and a trick of the enemy. And so there's things that you're going to have to, you're going to have to realize the devil has got some stuff. you got a sinful heart. God gives you a new heart. As a process in Ezekiel, he said, I would take away the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is a process. So when you're tempted, God's not tempting you. It says God can't be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt any man. You're tempted by your own sin. Oh, the devil, he just came. He just ran me over. Now, he runs over children. I'm not going to... I've seen... When you are molested, when you're a woman and you're raped... 
There's times he will run you over. This is a sin-stained, foul world. But the most of the time when we're talking about believers, guys are always, or gals, wanting to blame, oh, the devil just did this. Hey, look, he came because something was in your heart. And so the Lord is trying to let you find out what's in there so you can get it out of there. So you can be freed from it. Because when, when that desire is conceived, now you had to contemplate on it for a while. Nobody just bumps into adultery. It's never happened. You just got, hey, you just got to a little dissatisfaction with your wife. You just got a little dissatisfaction with your husband. And then when that desire starts growing and growing, you keep feeding it, bam, it's going to give birth to sin. But sin now, once it takes off, this thing, you, some of you are sinning right now. Hey, this thing's already conceived. It's already been given birth, and you're running with this thing. But you better stop it now because when it's full, full grown, death comes. You die sometimes. You get sick. You get cancer. You're in the ER. You, you lost the business. You're 55 years old, and your money's gone, and you got to start all over again. You, this thing's no joke. It's a warning. I fear least in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, I fear least somehow the serpent, as he, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. This devil's not coming up with some hieroglyphics to come, uh, I think I have a curse, and people tell, oh, you have Lucifer and uh, Harry Potter in there, and I can't get him out. Leaving this person like, whoa, what do you mean? You can't get Harry Potter out of here? What, what, what's wrong? And they go home dejected. You should never leave a deliverance ministry dejected. The minute you got one yawn, one cough, one bit of truth, and you grabbed it and received it as yours, you got blessed. And now you're in the process. You have to be fully committed to get some of these spirits out. A lot of men, they don't want to give up lust. My buddy, we had a chance. I'm telling too many stories. I'm going to stop after this one and just stay in the word. <laughs> we go to Mexico. Not only do we just go to Mexico, we go to Juarez, Mexico. I mean, this is, people are oppressed by the devil. Here's how everyone walks around. No one will even look at you. I mean, it is an oppressed country like you can't believe. And we go up on this hill, and this guy, we're going there. My brother was uh, supporting some orphanage. So my buddy comes with me. He's blessed. He wants to give back. And we go there and this guy's got this orphanage. It's got 16 foot walls with barbed wire. It's got these huge chains and locks. And he goes, no one can ever leave the orphanage at any time. Someone always has to be here. And I looked at him thinking, what do you got? Like two wash machines and some bunk beds? What would you steal here? And uh, this guy was from Texas that ran this thing. And uh, he was a good guy. We started seeing the way he helped people and the way he uh, took care of all these kids. There, a lot of those women and men, they work in these factories, and the buses pick them up at 5 in the morning, and they don't come back till 5, 6 at night. So these kids are just running around by themselves. And so he would take them in, give them food, have them a the safe place to hang out. And my buddy goes to him, and he goes, man, I got a problem. It's lust. He didn't tell him how gross that problem was. It was so gross that he had his buddy hiring good secretaries that were already screened of a woman that he could have sex with before they were ever hired at the company. And then it was just a matter of him getting to know her, but he already knew her character and the type of woman that she was, and, and it was all a setup. And he tells this man a little bit about it. He goes, how do you get rid of lust? How do you get rid of this? You know, it's like so hard to beat this. Like everywhere I go, that's all I think about. And the guy goes, well, let me tell you. And he was a real short guy. And he goes, man, you know, all my life I was never an athlete. I was never very smart. I was never a popular kid, a funny kid. I was just kind of an average kid all my life. And all my life I only dreamed about having a beautiful woman. That was my only dream. Some dream about yachts and, and mansions. I only dreamed about a beautiful woman. And I'm married now and I love my wife. She's a gift from God. And, and she's very beautiful, but not in the way that I always envision from movies and from television. And he said, but one time I was counseling this woman. And I was helping her, and her husband had left her, and she was the most beautiful woman, he said, I ever had seen up close. She was everything I dreamt about. And I was a young counselor at my church, he said, and, and uh, one day she came, and she hugged me, and she kissed me. Our custom is always to kiss on the cheek. She kissed me on the lips. And he said, when she kissed me on the lips, my whole body lit up like a Christmas tree. 
He said it was the most incredible feeling I had ever felt in my life. He said, I never felt it with my wife. And she whispered in my ear and she says, I love you. No man has ever done for me what you've done for me. And I want to give you my body to show you my love. And he said, right there, he said, I knew I had a choice. The devil was giving me the opportunity to have everything he had put into my head, everything I had been dreaming about since a little boy, and always in the back of my mind, even as a believer, it was right there on a platter. Or was I going to obey God? And there was a loud voice with the devil and a small voice. Here's your proof that you love me. And he says, I kissed her on her cheek back. I took a step back and he says, because I love you, I won't do to you what those men did to you. And he walked away. Amen. And we sat there and I looked at that guy. I said, whoa, that was God talking to us. But he couldn't do it. He didn't want to give up those things in his heart. Was divorced two years later. Uh, He won't marry anyone now because he doesn't want to divide up his money. You just got to be a permanent side chick. And he was a born-again Christian. He wouldn't give up what was in his heart. There's some stuff. You hate people? Man, hatred is more powerful than lust. Somebody demoralized you. Someone stomped on you. Some ministry partner turned on you. Somebody beat you up as a kid. Someone hurt your family. Someone robbed your family, raped your family member. And you hate these people. Everything in your flesh says you're justified. Everything in the course of this world says that's justified to hate. But God says, because I love you, I want you to forgive them. Because I forgave you of all your sin, I want you to do the same. Paul said in Romans 7, 20, wrapping it up, a few more verses. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What what part of people don't get this as demons he's talking about? Sin, how can, sin is what? Sin is an action. Sin is not uh, an it. This is something that's living in us. And Paul was working through it. Hey, I had some foul thoughts. Hey, I I got some corruptness. Hey, you know what? I think about going back to Judaism. I think about being a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. I think about having some money. I think about not being shipwrecked, bitten by vipers, flogged and stoned and beaten with rods. I think about this sometimes. But you know what? I know the calling of God. And so I beat my body down in submission and I make this body my slave. I make this body my slave that it will obey me and it will do what my spirit man wants me to do. (sighs) Come on. Come on. If he had to do it, we got to do it. Be angry, Ephesians 4, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. If you got a place in your heart, your deliverance is going to go real slow. If you give up that person, you forgive yourself. You for, Hey, that business thing, you're going to learn from that, that failed business. You're going to learn from picking up mental illness. You think you just picked up mental illness? I know the doctor told you that it comes, schizophrenia comes in your mid-20s. It's hereditary. No. The same demons came down that family line getting you sinning just like your daddy sinned and your granddaddy, and the spirit jumped on you. And the solution is Jesus Christ will give you a new mind and a new heart. He'll deliver you from these foul devils. Because when, now, So we can give him a place. Matthew 12, when a demon comes out of a man... It's not over here, YouTubers. He's not on your shoulder. I tried that. I anointed my house with oil five times, did everything I could to get him out of my house. Didn't realize he was in this house. I'll return to my house, it says. He thinks your body is his legal right. How did he get legal right? From your sin. That was the open door. He's the accuser of the brethren. What's he accusing you of? You can't lie to God. He's accusing you of your violation of God's word saying, hey, he's given me place. He keeps serving me. I got authority to take more. I got authority to crush this dream. I got authority to do this and that. You can't give place to this devil. You got to take back the authority that Jesus defeated the devil on the cross of Calvary. He descends into hell and he disarms hell. He resurrects from the dead on the third day with all power in his hand. And he'll give you this power if you'll use it in accordance with to the scriptures. He's going to set you free, but you got to repent. 
You must repent. If we don't repent, your, your deliverance lasts down the road. There was these deliverance ministers, used to see them on TV, and he'd start charging demons. Come out in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And someone will start freaking out. You're really loaded? Them demons can't take the heat. Those are really chucked people. And then he would make a spectacle of it. How'd you get in there? What's your name? And then this person, ah, I'm not telling you. Ah. And then he wants to be Superman of God. How'd you get in there? What's your name? Where are you from? Look, oh, you, it's the simplicity of Jesus Christ. They're manifesting, hey, there's something you need to repent of. Because he's taking full control over you right now. That's contrary completely to the word of God. You simply repent. And once you repent, we'll command him to come out. That's deliverance. It's not to be glorifying some man. Oh, you're Superman of God. You Superman? I'll see you in two years in my office. I guarantee you. There's no Superman in the... Yeah, God gives these powerful anointings to people. But those powerful anointings are given to people who have more submission to God. More reverence for God. Who walk a thin and narrow line for God. Those are now trusted vessels with more. So you want that anointing? Just be faithful to help people. Unwind these demons that are in people. If you get down and somebody trusts you and you get past, do you know Jesus loves you? Praise God. It all starts with that. Oh, you're born again. Hey, do you know you got to be saved? Sit down with someone for a minute. They got to trust you. And, and the more you talk to them, the more they'll tell you. And let me tell you, I'm, people are messed up. You know, you're messed up. You've got a laundry list of mess ups. Here and there, coming and going. It's just human nature. And once you get yourself set free, you can point them to the Word of God and show them where the enemy came in. And most people are fighting themselves. They don't even know they're fighting the devil. And they're wrestling with all these wounds and pains that never go away until you forgive the people. And now the devil can be cast out. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to what cleanse us from this unrighteousness. There's a cleansing process through deliverance where you get set at liberty. <clears throat> Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper. We can't cover them. You want to forget about them? You better bring them to the front here and lay these things down. You've been doing them for years. You think they went away. Time has covered them. No, they have not. He who covers them will not prosper. It will stop your prosperity. But he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Confess them and forsake them. That's all you got to do. And mercy, mercy comes in. Oh, I, I, that's where I learned the most with God was mercy. Everybody comes in the jail. We got the word of God. We're anointed to preach. And we come in and preach. We're the soldiers of Jesus. Man, mercy comes in. You stop all that running around like an idiot. You start looking for mercy to jump on somebody. Not your big talk and your bold speaking and your mighty knowledge of the word of God. You're looking for mercy to jump on somebody. Now you get somebody that changes because mercy changes people. God is a kind God. He's a loving God. He's looking to bless you. He's looking to help you. He's looking to forgive you. He's looking to deliver you from these devils. He hates the devil. But in order for you to deliver from a devil, you've got to hate him like he hates him. So he don't come back. 1 Peter 2 and 24, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. You are healed. You can be healed today. You can be healed today. Spirits of infirmity are real. Christians and bad backs, that's the Lord's specialty in the jail, boy. Them spirits will jump on you from sleeping on those cots. God heals them all the time just to give them a nice little touch hey I'll heal you I'll heal your body I've seen blind eyes literally blind eyes open more than one or two guys two three guys with deaf ears glaucoma bad knees all these things why I'm the anointed man of God didn't you hear Karina very anointed no it's mercy looking to jump on people it's mercy looking to jump on somebody. See, I got some stories. I don't tell them stories in here. I got some real stories about my failures, but I ain't going to tell them on YouTube. No way. But I'll tell them in jail. We don't have any cameras in there. And you know what happens? Guys go, oh, my goodness. I misjudged this person. Wow. If he got a touch because he was humbled 
this is how I'm going to get my touch. Amen. We, we, we got to be kind to people. Now, I'm not the most kindest person. I, I, I jumped on those guys a little bit Thursday. I got a little frustrated. I made them all make a commitment. They had to be here on Friday. You got to be here and put your deliverance first. Then I got a call yesterday. Now, I can't come. Got to go to a Bible study in Mesa. I said, will you just be there tomorrow? Nope, can't. Going to Toby Mac. I already bought the tickets. Uh, Christian concert. <laughs> I told him he didn't need another Toby Mac. Right? Well, Toby Mac wasn't going to do him no good. I'm not always the kindest person. Neither will you be. But look, if you let mercy have its full way in you, then it can jump out of you and jump onto some people. Amen. You can see some stuff. See, a lot of people, they're waiting for some healing. Lord, let me know when that heal. One time it came on me, the healing, the power. It was, whoa, man, I was ready. I was touching people at church. They were dropping like sacks of potatoes. But look, it's not like God can flow through anybody who wants him to be used as a vessel to him. He'll flow right through you all the time. And, and what he'll do is he'll jump on those people. His jail is... So this ministry, I believe we can all get a touch. We've, we've, you all came here on your own free will. You all wanted to be here. You know it's a deliverance ministry. You got deliverance in the back of your mind, the front of your mind. You're in the middle of your deliverance. We can all get a touch. In jail, some people are coming for entertainment. And so the Word of God will only do so much because you have to receive it. And so He'll jump on some people, and some people will sit there like, what was all this going on? And that's great. They got a visual example of God's mercy. They heard the word, and so God's doing something. But you know what? If you don't want God to touch you in here, and you want to handle your own deliverance, and you want to do it at your speed, and you think you got it all, and you don't want God to search your heart and to show you some things that are foul to him, you don't want to dig them up, then you know what? You can get missed, even in this place. It can, it can miss you. But I say, I wouldn't, don't let that happen. The days are too short. All you got to do is humble yourself for deliverance. That's all I had to do. That's all Katrina, Karina, my fault, my Karina, and that's all how Robert had to do. That's all Mike had to do. That's all all of us had to do here was humble ourselves. I didn't know how deliverance worked. I said, all I know is I got problems. According to the Word of God, I have problems. And Lord, I need a touch. Yeah. Boom. The minute I forgave my, my partner, I only had problems with one guy, a guy who stabbed me in my back. I mean, you stabbed me in my, my face. Hey, at least I saw it coming. I was, you know, I could have some respect for it. But this one was in the dark, in the back, a backroom deal to, to stick me and my uncle and to take our money. Hey, it was bad. But I still was accountable to the word of God to forgive. I wasn't above it because I was a jail minister, because I was a good guy and I didn't cheat on my wife and I, and I didn't drink and do drugs. No, because I didn't forgive him, I went back to smoking weed. Mm -hmm. I got drugged back years, a decade, right back to the old sins. Because the devil can have a place with unforgiveness. So in order to have this altar call, I guarantee you, you got to be honest with yourself right here. Otherwise, we got to play 20 questions. The devil's so smart, he always puts at least a few people in your way who you don't like. Legitimately, they ripped you off, they hurt you, they scammed you, they stabbed you in your back. He does it on purpose so that he knows he can always get in, mess your life up, to have that place that he desires. So we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer for forgiveness. And in that time, I'll, I'll pray blessings on, on us that got to go. But ultimately, we're praying that prayer so that we can get to this altar and get the miracle. I believe Christians don't have to live, live with back pain, knee pain, arthritis, diabetes. I believe God can heal every single disease that you have. It said by his stripes we are healed. That means it's been paid for. We just got to cash the check. How do we cash the check? Having faith in his word and believing that he wants to heal us and help us. What's hindering you from believing? Carrying around some sins. Carrying around some stuff that you don't want to deal with. So we got to repent. And we got to forgive some people. So I'm going to pray for us that are leaving. And every one of us, I believe, is a level of some kind of forgiveness. And often it's yourself. Often you can start cursing yourself. You've, you've called yourself enough names. Hey, the Spirit said, hey, I got legal right. Let me come on in. He said he was a loser. Let's go ahead and make him lose a little. 
He said that he's no good. Hey, he said it enough times. Let me go ahead and make him no good. So we got to forgive ourselves so those curses can be broken. Every curse can be broken with confession and repentance. We can get rid of everything. Well, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for all my friends that came, Lord, to see you, Lord. And Lord, in your presence, Father, in your presence, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, as we have been forgiven, we receive it, Lord. We have been forgiven. There's no longer any shame and guilt. It's not you, Lord. You've been disciplining us as sons. But Lord, you have never rejected us. Lord, you send the Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us, to comfort us, to help us. Holy Spirit, Lord, we invite you, Lord. We repent, Lord, of these people we've been hating. Lord, this is sin. It's a serious sin before heaven. And by faith, Lord, I want to forgive myself. I want to forgive these people. Just forgive those people before you go. That's the one thing. We're going to have an altar call to repent from our sins and get our miracles and our deliverance. But everybody, we forgive them, Lord. There's some people that, hey, they weren't the best pastors. They weren't the best Bible study leaders. And I was out of order. I despised the position that they had gotten from you, Lord. And I tried to supersede it. I undermined it. I gossiped behind it. Lord, I want you to forgive me from taking offense for these people's deficiencies, inadequacies, or their sins. I did not deal with it in a manner that was biblical. I did it in sin, Lord. And now these people, I have a disdain in my heart for them. I have a, a, a mindset that I look down upon them. And that always works in reverse where I think of myself better than them. And I'm a, no better than them, Lord. I'm a servant, Lord. I'm saved by grace. And so I forgive these people. And I repent of hating people. Thank you, Jesus, that you hear my prayer. And Lord, as my friends have to get going, I pray, Lord, I believe they've been fighting the good fight. They've been running the race to win. And Lord, I thank you that strategically you're setting up those divine appointments for them to win for your glory, to see people saved, healed, and delivered. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that when they step out on faith, that they will see your divine miracles jump right out onto those people so people get healed and saved. So that people catch the vision biblically of going on to becoming a disciple, a servant of God with their whole heart. I send blessings on them and safe travels in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. YouTubers, we're going to go to the altar call. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we, if you got to run to the bathroom, do it quick. People that got to go, God bless you. But if you know you were listening to that message and you know there's something you need a touch from God, one for a miracle, Two, you need deliverance. It all begins with some sort of repentance. That's the only thing that's hindered you. We're going to have the prayer team come forward and just make your way to the front. And we're going to have an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to jump right on you and to touch you. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I guess I'll follow your lead. We'll go ahead and just go through some deliverance in our seat. And then if you got a, you need a jump start, then we will, uh, we will uh, have you just come forward if you get in a, in a little bit of a, a blockage. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Just agree in this prayer with me. This will be your prayer. I'm praying a prayer of proxy like I'm you, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive us, Lord. We have sins that we have no idea our sins. Lord, we have picked up spirits in a way we never imagined we could have ever picked up a spirit, Lord. But Lord, we thank you that all things are visible, Lord, in your eyes. And I want to repent of these sins, Lord. I've been casual with sin. I've been casual with the things of God. The anointing that you placed in me, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. I've taken you in places, Lord, I knew you would never go. I didn't even have to ask. I knew you didn't want to go there. I said things, Lord, I never should have said, Lord God. I want you to forgive me, Heavenly Father. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. I'm so sorry for the lust, walking around for years, just lusting with my eyes over every body part. Forgive me, Lord, of 
coveting. I want in something else that wasn't mine. Never being thankful for what you did give me. Always looking for somebody that had something better. Wondering where mine was and when mine was coming. I want you to forgive me, Lord Jesus, of this covetousness, Lord. Everything that I needed, Lord, you've always supplied, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. I want to tell you I'm sorry. I've given place to the devil. And I don't want to let that devil have any place in my life anymore. Heavenly Father, have mercy on me, Lord. Forgive me of letting this devil have place in my life. I repent right now in Jesus' name. I renounce this devil in Jesus' name. I renounce the devil in Jesus' name. I break every oath I ever had with you. Oaths I had when I was in a fraternity. Oaths I had when I was in the police department. Oaths I had when I was a young kid in a neighborhood. I break and loose myself from every oath and covenant I ever had with the devil. I renounce every bit of new age and witchcraft and the cults I was involved in in my past. I break and loose myself from every generational curse in the name of Jesus. Curses passed, passed down from the forefathers and preceding generations that have influenced my life. I break and loose myself from them in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I now stand in a position of authority over you, devil. I'm right with God. My sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus, and I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, commanding you to get out of my mind and my body. I command every bit of shame and guilt and poor self-worth to come out of my body in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I command you to come out out of me right now. I command you to let me go in the name of Jesus. It's time folks, you got to engage in the warfare or they're not going anywhere. I command every foul devil of complacency towards the things of God to come out in the mighty name of Jesus. I command you, you foul devil. I command you to let me go in the name of Jesus. I command you to take your claws off me, you foul devil. I command you and renounce you. I no longer give you place in my body. I'm no longer going to serve you. I'm no longer going to be a slave to sin. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, I command you to go. Mental illness, I command you to go. Porn, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. I command you to let me go now. Take a big breath. Go, devil. Go. Command them to go and they will come out of your life. I command you to go. Rejection and hatred. Wounds on my soul from people that hurt me. I command you to go. Wounds on my soul. I command you to let me go. Right now in the name of Jesus. Engage in the fight and you will get your deliverance. Now, devil, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you, you foul devil. Let's go. Come out. Go, you foul devil. Come out. Devil's attacking his mind. Come out. Devil's attacking his mind. Go. Go, you liar. Go. Nice and easy. Take a big breath. It'll come right out. Go, devil. Go. Go. Keep going, devil. Go. Mental illness and confusion. Hard heart of rebellion. Come out of there. Hard heart of rebellion. Come out of there. Hard heart of rebellion. Come out of there right now. Hard heart of rebellion. Keep going. Come out of there. Come out of there. Come out of there. We bind your power now, devil. I bind every generational curse of hard heart of rebellion and self-sufficiency. Machismo, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command self-exaltation to come out in the name of Jesus. He humbled himself in the mighty in the sight of God by coming to the altar. And devil, you must let him go right now in the name of Jesus. Just speak it out. Devil, you must let me go. I renounce this perversion. I renounce this anger. I command you to go right now. Go. Go. Come out of there. Go. Devil, let him go right now in Jesus' name. Who's the person that really hurt you that you forgave? Uh, my dad. Your dad. What's his name? Joe. Joe. And you forgave him from your heart? Yeah. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you led him, Lord, to repentance, Lord. That he forgave his father, Joe. Lord, we forgive him, Lord, from our hearts. I command this spirit that now mimics Joe and the pain that came in when it was little from the beatings and from the anger and from the rage, the drinking. I command it to go right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I call the spirit of Joe out right now. I know you're a demon that mimics his father. And I command you to go right now. Take a big breath. Let him go, devil. Let him go. Joe, come out of there in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out of there right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joe, come out of there right now. 
Go, 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 go out, go out, you go out, drive them out in your mind. I command you, come out. These wounds from my dad, all these word curses from my dad, I break them in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I break them right now in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Come out, come out. If you're having a hard time, just come forward. We'll pray for you one on one. Come out, devil. Let's go. What are you sensing when we're praying these prayers? You feel anything in your body at all? Do you feel anything? You feel completely normal. What's your main problem that you need a deliverance? Yeah? Okay. How long you had that anxiety and fear? Since you were a little kid. On, on what? A meth? Okay. Alright. Heavenly Father, Lord. I know this demon came in when he was little, when he started going through those relationships, Lord, that were filled full of abuse, hardship, and pain. I know that's when the demon jumped in his life. I began to separate him from his loved ones, and it caused fear. It is fear. And now that same spirit is driving him back again and again and again to meth. Lord, I want you to deliver him from the spirit of rejection, Lord. And fear. Fear has to do with torment, but perfect love cast out fear. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Now I bind fear, the foul spirit of fear that came in when his father was yelling and screaming and going violent. I bind your power in the name of Jesus. I know you brought in meth years later, you foul devil of pharmacia and sorcery. I bind your power in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. And I command you now, fear, fear that came in when he was a kid, come out right now in Jesus' name. Come out, devil. Come out. Come out, fear. Fear, come out. Fear, fear, come out right now. Fear, come out right now. Come out right now. Real big. Go, go out, go out. Fear, fear, come out right now. Fear, come out of that body right now. Fear, I command you to come out. Fear, go, fear, go right now. Go, fear, come out. Go, go. Fear, come out. Come out. Hey, can you grab that uh, bucket for me? Come out. Fear, come out. Come out. Fear, keep coming out. Fear, you come out now. Fear, you come out now. Fear, come out. Fear, come out. Come out. You keep coming out of there, fear. Fear, they come out when he was little. Come out. Fear, come out of there now. Hold on to that. Fear, come out. Come out, fear. Fear, come out of there. Fear, come out. Hold on to this. Fear, fear come out. Fear that came in when his dad was yelling at him. Come out. Fear, come out. Fear, come out of the childhood wounds of fear and rejection. Come out. Meth, come out of there now. I know that fear led in meth. Come out now. Come out. Come out in the mighty name of the Lord. Keep going, sir. He's delivering you now. What can we pray for? I need, I need a fresh anointing. I'm battling with my son. He's homeless. I believe the, the devil and the demons are using him from stopping me to minister and bringing other people to the kingdom. Okay. So my son doesn't know that. He's battling with bipolar. Okay. But he doesn't know he's being used. And he dabbles with all other religions, Egyptian, Tarot. Okay, excellent. Okay, I know how to help you. Just relax. Okay, what do you have to do, though? The hard part is you got to turn your son over to God. You're a good minister, but you can't be the Holy Spirit, okay? Just pray this prayer with me, Heavenly Father. Lord, I, told, I trust you with my son. I repent, Lord, of trying to be the Holy Spirit to my son. I turn him over to you, Holy Spirit. And I pray you would come get him. And I've, I've received this burden, Lord, that's not from you. It's because of the failures in this world. But I forgive myself. And I repent. I want you to set me free now. So I can do what you called me to do. In Jesus' name. You heard that, devil. Take a big breath. You heard that, devil. Come out. Come out. Nice couple breaths. Come out. Generational witchcraft. Come out. That came down from the forefathers. Come out. Come out. Guilt and shame. Come out. Guilt and shame. Come out. Come out. False burden. Come out right now. Take a big breath. It's right there. Come out. Let her go. Let her go in the name of Jesus. Let her go in the name of Jesus. I find your power. Come out, Satan. Come out in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Come out now. All generational witchcraft. Come out. All generational witchcraft and sorcery. Come out. Come out right now. All burdens. All spirits that lie in the mind. Go. Go in the mighty name of Jesus. Go. Go out. 
Come out. Go. Go. Witchcraft, sorcery, and divination that passed down from the forefathers. Come out. Come out. Destruction and the destroyer. Come out. Take a big breath. There he is. Go. 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 Okay. Just relax. Take a couple more big breaths. You got to relax here. Come on. You got to let the Holy Ghost in. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling her, Lord. She needed the fresh anointing, Lord. We thank you that you're coming, Lord, to set her free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go, devil. Go. Keep coming out of this woman. Go, you foul devils. Devils of witchcraft, sorcery, and divination. Go. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Streamers, just keep battling here. Keep battling. Keep going through this. Keep commanding relief. Get your miracle. Get your healing. Get your touch.